And my reading will be from Mark 8, verse 31 to 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this all quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Y'all will join me in, in prayer. Uh, Father God, I was wrestling last night on what to pray before my sermon this morning. Uh, many things crossed my mind. Uh, crossed my mind that we're in the middle of 40 days of Lent, and we're remembering the 40 days Jesus spent in the desert. It uh, struck me that we're, we're looking forward to Easter, we're looking forward to Sunday when, when he rises again. It struck me that... Uh, we had such an intimate service this week, and uh, I was hoping more people would be here. I'm thankful that you brought many more people and two new guests. And it's mostly on my mind. I hope that uh, you would speak through me, uh, have everyone here hear what they need to hear out of your word and your, and your message to them. In the name of the risen Christ, I pray this is Amen. Amen. Okay, this is y'all probably already hearing my, my voice is a little ragged, so bear with me. I'm, I have a little bit of whatever's going around town. So, here in Mark 8, Jesus' ministry is at a bit of a turning point. Not a bit of a turning point. It is at a turning point. So, he has to answer a simple question. And there he is answering a simple question in this verse. How do you give your life meaning? doesn't seem like that's what he's doing when you look at it first. We might think passages about who will receive eternal life when we read, those who are ashamed of me and my words, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he, return, when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. But not long after this exchange, Peter himself would become so ashamed of Christ that he would deny him three times. Clearly, based on what we read of Peter after this, he wasn't too worried about losing his salvation in that moment. So when Jesus asks, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit the life, their life, he was talking about something else. When you get to the end of your life and look back, and surely ripped on this a little bit, I was rather, it's like we coordinated, but we didn't talk at all, it was wonderful. Um, so like she was talking about with the children, when we get to the end of our lives and we look back, is our life going to amount to something? Is it going to have been worth living? Or did we waste our time? How do we guarantee it's going to have meaning? Or as Jesus said in another place, how do we have life and have it more abundantly? So the turning point I mentioned. Jesus is preparing to lead them into Jerusalem. And he's just turned to uh, Peter and the disciples not too long beforehand and asked them a question, who am I? And they said, you are the Messiah. They finally come to the point they see that. And Jesus knows based on that they're going on into Jerusalem. But they misunderstood who the Messiah was. They saw the Messiah as a king like David who would raise an army and march into Jerusalem and conquer the city, kick the Romans out. But as we know, Jesus wasn't that kind of Messiah. He 
wasn't the Messiah they were expecting, but he was the one that was predicted. In our passage, you hear the same thing in Isaiah 53. We hear about a man of suffering who was despised and rejected by others, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And in the same passage a bit earlier, he will be raised up. Jesus basically repeats Isaiah 53 when he says that the Son of Man will undergo suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed as the slam led to the slaughter, and rise again. Peter, on the other hand, sees Jesus' ministry as breaking records. Four and five thousand people at a time are out there listening to Jesus in little towns. We would call that a rock star crowd. Not only that, he's reaching, he's been targeting just the Jewish audience, but he's got people coming from all over the region to listen to him. Peter is ready to go in victorious to Jerusalem to conquer it, riding on these huge crowds that Jesus is drawing. And Jesus is turning to him saying, no, that's not what we're doing. People, sorry. <laughs> Essentially, Jesus yanked the rug out from under. They thought they were on one program. He's on another. So Peter thinks it's his job to correct Jesus, very much like he thought it was his job to answer Jesus' question. He thinks it's his job to correct Jesus. By correcting God's above my pay grade, but Peter thought it was, it was his job. So he starts rebuking, harshly correcting Jesus. Jesus, you can't do this if you want to fill in some words. And Jesus stops him, cuts him off, and turns from Peter, who's pulled him aside, turns and faces the disciples, because he knows this question isn't just coming from one man, it's coming from the whole group. And he immediately says, get behind me, Satan. Which makes this a very weird passage to wrestle with. Every time I've read this before, it's like, is he saying Peter is actually Satan? No, actually, I don't think he is. As I was digging this time, I, I realized, I got a little crib note help from a study Bible. This is echoing the temptation in the desert. So, in the desert, for a refresher, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit up there, and then Satan tempts him three times. And one of them is he takes him up where he can see all the kingdoms of the world. Said, I will give these to you. I will make you. I will let you rule them all. And essentially, this is the same temptation. Instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing, Jesus, we want you to go run human kingdoms. We want you to conquer them. So Peter is unintentionally letting Satan put a stumbling block in front of Christ. So fundamentally, Jesus is speaking the same, but he's also letting his disciples know that's not what we're doing. You've got it wrong. You know, when I, when I think about this idea of Jesus getting uh, charge of human kingdoms, the catch about all those human kingdoms, they all ultimately fail. The Roman Empire that ruled Jerusalem was long gone by this is long gone by this point, but the kingdom of God that Jesus started is still here alive and ruling in this room and every church in town and every church across the world. If Jesus had given in here, his work would have all fallen apart. Instead, he's got all of us. In some ways, it struck me. Peter is a bit like Joshua leading the Israelites into Canaan. So Joshua, they're about to uh, attack Jericho. So with the trumpets, circle the city. And he gets there and dances the army. And there's the angel that leads God's armies who's there, the proverbial flaming sword. And Joshua looks and says, whose side are you on? Theirs or ours? And the we would think the angel would say, I'm on yours. No, the angel says, no, I'm not on either side. This is holy ground. Take off your shoes. 
that angel, like Jesus, isn't here to be on our side, but he is giving us the chance to be on his side and build what God has come here to build. Like Joshua, Peter and the disciples could look around and see plenty of alternatives. Caesarea Philippi, where this first happens, um, I, I started reading about it. It's, you know, it's like Jesus planned this moment because you, the ancient Canaanites had built one of their worship sites for Baal here. Later on, after Alexander went through and conquered the world, the Greeks put, put a, a temple to Pan in a grotto outside of town, actually renamed the town Panaeus. Later on, when Herod, the first Herod came along, he built this big white uh, temple in worship of the Roman emperor at the time. And then Herod's son, Philip, about this time, has renamed, or not too long before this time, has renamed it after Tiberius Caesar. And in a wonderful act of self-worship, himself. So the disciples could look around, there's all these things they could choose. All these things they could choose other than God's plan. And Christ is saying, not that, this, follow me. They could choose all the kingdoms of the world, the power of Herod and Rome, the Baals and Pans, or they could follow Christ and give their life a meaning. To choose God, he explains, it's a three-step formula. Deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. When he says deny ourselves, he's talking about all the things we think of as us, all the noise, the noise and stuff, the arguments and fears, all the things we pick up and fill our lives with. It's very hard to make room for God if your life is full of all this other stuff. Or you can make room for God, you have to clear space. Second, he says, take up your cross. He's looking both forward to what he's going to do, bear that cross to Golgotha. But his audience, they, not, they don't understand that, but they do understand this is what all the convicts, Roman convicts, are going to do, and they carry that to their death. My throat's rough because I'm fighting. I'm on the tail end of something. I lost my place. Sorry. So when he says this to him, uh, them about taking up the cross, what's at the core of it is decisively make the choice for God. Choose that cross. Choose God. In more modern terms, you have to choose how you define yourself, first and foremost, choose to do it in relation to God. Not all the noise around you, not what other people would expect of you, but what God would expect of you. Clear space, and then you choose what you're gonna base your life on. Once you've done those two things, clear space for God and identify with him and what he's up to, and as you continue to do these two things, it's not a one time deal, you have to continue to do these. There's a third part. He asks us to follow him. Thank you, Shirley. Um, you have to walk in the same road with him. And I, I love being kids. We're up here and we're singing about following him, walking with him. That is beautiful. Step by step by step by step by step. Moment by moment by moment by moment. It's very easy. Choose the next step, choose the next step. You have to act. You've cleared space. You got your priorities right. Do something with it. Walk. That, and that word, it, it's a little more than just what you think of at first blush. There's a sense of, of learning, of almost conversation about that word when you really dig into it and breathe. It's not just a literal following, but we would we would say the same in English. I can, you know, I I can follow a rock star. I'm a rock star fan. I follow them. I learn about them. I know all their music. On and on and on. 
It's like kind of a bit like a conversation. Except here, we do it with things like our Bible and prayer, meditation, how we live out love in our lives day to day. Step by step by step by step. We didn't coordinate, we really didn't. <laughs> so I'm gonna, as I'm concluding, I wanna point something new out that's kind of subtle in here that's always throwing me about some of these verses until I dig into them. I, um, I started as a Christian over in the Baptist world, and it's it's harped on over there. The four points, da 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 da, da repent and believe. It's not here. At least it doesn't look like it's here. So instead of what pointing this huge crowd of people who haven't seen him, some have, instead of telling him, here's how you start, he says, here's where I can take you. We'll get to that. But come with me, I will make you fishers of men. I will give your life meaning. It's going to take a while to learn how to do this. And you'll figure out, a, we'll have a conversation about the repent and believe. But first, I've got to get you on board. We're going to go to the cross together. I'm going to give you meaning in your life. Step by step by step by step. Follow me. And the repent and believe will follow in time. And I lost my place again. So I didn't bring a joke for you, Rocky, but so I'm going to be the punchline today. You know, that <laughs> oh, so the road Jesus lays out will not always be easy. And it will take at least a lifetime to master. But it boils down to these three things that Jesus describes as denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. Make space for God by clearing other things away. You have to clear space in your life for God. To find yourself, first and foremost, in relation to God and not the world around you. And act on it. Follow him. We know these steps. Read our Bibles. Push to understand what it says. Dig in. Pray. Meditate. Meet together with other believers. And live like him, loving others. Let it make a difference in the world. And sometimes when you're on that road, he will call you to do the crazy and impossible. Stealing a line from something my wife sent me. He may even ask, have you move a mountain? And it may just be to show you someone else it can be done. God can do all things. We have faith. He's asking for your whole life. But when he does this, he looks at you and love. And says, I want to fill your life with meaning. I want to give you your life back. You filled your life up with all this other stuff. I want to free your life and give you back a life that is worth living. How do you give your life meaning? Follow. Y'all will join me in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for what I've said right and for uh, what everyone needed to hear today. They'll carry, please let us each carry these, uh, your word out in the world and put it into practice day by day. Give us the strength to make the choices that you would have us make and to be witness uh, for your son and the path he calls us all to. Uh, thank you, Father, for bringing us all together. Keep me safe here. Please be everyone safe on the way home. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you would all stand with me, we're going to sing Christ Beside Me and speaking of following, uh, this is the same tune as Morning Has Broken. And I'm sure that many of you know that. So please join us. Christ